yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fled. Sorry for being out in the class no, week. No, uh, I had to go to Seattle for some stuff. Uh, and then uh, my uh, caught COVID in her, in her Lolo. So like I was trying to, I had to do a bunch of extra stuff. I wasn't around her when she was sick, which just ate up all my time. So I apologize for not posting this, uh, this lecture while I was gone and also not like updating the schedule. But as I post on Piazza, uh, this, is just, this is basically where the class we should have had last Wednesday, but we'll start today. And then everything's just been shifted up uh, by, by one. And then we dropped the materialized view uh, lecture. All right, so a lot to cover today, so let's, let's jump into this. Um, so today's lecture is about uh, the, sort of the, the, talking about the, the, the lowest point of the database system, meaning like how we're actually going to represent data in the database on disk and, and, and in memory. Right? What are the actual bits or the bytes for representing uh, you know, tuples and their attributes and their values and so forth? And what the data is going to look like is going to have a... Uh, you know, a very important impact or, or influence on how we're going to design the rest of the database system. In particular, we're, we're going to talk about row storage versus column storage, because that was the paper you guys are assigned reading. And just whether it's a row store or a column store, whether the data is laid out in rows or, or a column on chain format, that determines so many different aspects of the system and the different design choices we can make, like how we're going to process tuples, how we're going to move data from one, one relational operator to the next, uh, how we're going to materialize the intermediate results as we go from one operator to the next. What, what algorithms are going to use? Like, some joins will be faster on because we're a column store because our, our hash, hash table can be much smaller. Uh, whether or not we're going to support uh, ingestion updates, that one we'll cover a little bit today, but we won't go too much into this. Uh, actually, not until we talk about data breaks at the end, end of the semester. For current control, how to support transactions, we're actually going to ignore all this as well. But like, just think about if I need to update data uh, tuple that's split up into columns. Well, now I got to go maybe acquire latches or locks for bunch of different physical locations in, on disk or in memory to do that update. Um, so again, we'll ignore that for now. And then query optimization, of course, is influenced by all of this. Like, the query optimizer should know, have to, has to know uh, what the data system is actually doing to determine what's the best query plan to use. So again, just in the back of your mind as we go along, even though today we're only talking about the lowest levels of the, of the storage layer, just, you will see that as we go out throughout the entire semester uh, that a lot of these things will you know, the decisions we'll make now will determine how we make other decisions uh, later on. And the other challenge also, too, is there'll be times when they, they will start talk about certain techniques in the storage models where it will, you know, the solution to a hard problem is what we will cover either next class or, or, or next week. And in particular, the fixed length data versus the variable length data. The solution is dictionary compression, which we will cover next week. Um, so the paper talks about these things, uh, but it's, we won't go into too much detail about it just, just yet. But just know that these things are also coming up later on. All right, so today we're going to focus mostly on the storage model. Again, row store versus column store versus the hybrid store. Then we'll talk about how we rep represent individual types. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to handle uh, partitioning at a high level. Okay? All right, so first thing, storage models. So a storage model is going to, going to, going to define how the, the, the database system is going to physically organize tuples on disk and in memory. Now, I say the database system is going to organize this is, is, as if it's responsible for actually laying down the bits uh, in a file. But as we said before, in a modern OLAP system, uh, you know, in this data lake model, it could be just a bunch of existing S3 buckets that already have CSVs or parquet files in it. And the data system it just knows how to read it. So for our purposes, just assume that, that the database system is the one generating this, the, this data. But as we know, it, it, it isn't always actually the case. OK? So there's be three choices. Uh, n area stores, the row store, decomposition storage model, that's the column store. And then the last one is the, the hybrid store, the PAX model. The, again, the paper you guys read came out, I think, in 2006. It is the definitive paper, in my opinion, even though it's old, it still is like the good, the best first paper or best paper that sort of describes exactly the, the pros and cons of a row store versus a column store. So you. Oh, whatever. It's, it's old, right? <laughs> uh, but again, you, you were what, in middle, middle school, elementary school? Like, elementary. Yeah, so it's old, right? Um, 
Yeah, I should have, yeah. Dan was already at Yale by then. He wasn't, he wasn't at MIT anymore. But like, there is a textbook that they, got, that they wrote about how to build column store systems. I obviously didn't want to assign that to you guys because it's like 100 pages. But this is a good, I think, a good summary of, of the pros and cons. But the, the thing I'll point out is they, they mention PAX, the PAX pair, and they cite it. They don't actually go into detail. But this is what, the, this is what Parquet is. This is what Orca is. This is what all the modern systems are using. Right? But we'll see. What, you know, we'll cover these, and then that will lead into why we want to do the last one. Okay, and then most systems today, when they say they're a column store, chances are they're this, they're packs. All right, so the anary storage model, the row store, row store model, is the, the database system going to store most of the attributes for a tuple continues with, the, with each other in a single page. And the reason why I say almost is that in, uh, in, in most systems that will support like very large variable length fields, like a text field, a var binary, for anything above a certain size, they then offload it into auxiliary storage pages. In Postgres, they call this toast. Uh, I think in like Oracle or, or MySQL, they call them overflow pages. Right? You, don't, you, don't, you don't inline them. So that's why I'm saying almost, but we can ignore you know, blobs for now. So the row storage is going to be ideal for OLT workloads where most of the transactions are only going to need to touch single entities or entries in the database. Um, and they can be very insert or update heavy workloads. And so by single entities, this mean like, you know, think there's a table of user accounts and you log in, you know, you're using some application, you log in, and you only touch your user account. There may be millions, but each individual transaction is only accessing a small number at a time. And so with this uh, storage model, the iterator processing model, or the volcano processing model, which we'll cover in a few weeks, this is the ideal uh, processing model for, for, the, for these workloads and for these, this storage model, because most of the queries are accessing a single at a time, a single tuple at a time, so the operator can just you know, go grab that one tuple and then feed it up to the query plan, to the next operator in the query plan. Most of the, the database systems that are going to be row stores are typically going to store uh, database page sizes in some constant multiple of what the harbor provides you. Right? The, 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 the largest atomic page size you can get, or atomic, largest page size that harbor provides that you can do atomic writes is four kilobytes. Um, and so most database systems, when they have their database pages, it'll, it'll be like 4 or 8 or 16 kilobytes. Right? They won't go really, really big, as we, see, we will see in, uh, in a column store system. Right? The reason is because if you're doing updates, you don't want to have like try to do a 1 megabyte update across a bunch of 4 kilobyte pages and then crash halfway through, and, and you got to go back and, and fix things up. So they try to keep things in, in, in smaller page sizes. So it essentially looks like this. So say I have a, a simple database that has six rows and three columns. Right? So in a, uh, a disk-oriented system, all of the, the pages, all the data that's going to be uh, both fixed length and variable length, we want to pack them together into a single page. All right? So the clicker does not work. All right, so we have our database page here. Again, some, some say it's four kilobytes. There's always going to be a header. Uh, and then you have the, the slot array. Right? Again, this is just a slot of page design. All right, these slots are going to point to locations in the page where you can find the given row. So if now, if another part of the system, like an index, wants to, wants to reference a tuple in a row oriented architecture, you'd use the page number and then the offset within the slot array. And then that way you can move things around in the page without worrying about having to update your indexes. Right? It's an additional layer of indirection. So say I want to insert this first tuple up here. Well, I'm going to put it at the end of the page and, and have the slot array now point to the header for this. So the way it works is the slot array will grow from the beginning to the end, and then all the data will grow, grow from the end to the beginning. All right, now I want to start the next tuple, and I just, again, I append it to uh, the end here, and then update my, my slot array. All right. So I can do this for all the other ones, and you end up with something like this. All right. So one thing to point out here is that for every single tuple, we're going to have a little header space for it in, in, the, in, the, in the page. Right? This will keep track of like, uh, which, which, which values are null, any other additional metadata. Typically, you don't put the schema there, because you store that in a centralized location in the catalog, because it's, otherwise it's, it's redundant. Right? All, the, all the tuples within a single page are for the same table, so you don't need to store that over and over again. Right? This header up here may contain like, maybe a checksum for the page, the version of the database system that generated it, and so forth. Right? But it's a lot, you know, for each single tuple, there's a lot of, uh, you know, that you're maintaining its own, its own header. 
All right, so now let's say I come along with an OLAP query like this. Really simple. I want to scan the entire table and find all, you know, compute the sum on column A and the average on column C for all tuples that are, you know, where column A is greater than 1,000, right? So the way you would process this query without even discussing what the processing model is, the way you would ex execute this query just on the single page, you'd have to jump into it and first go look at the header for every single entry as you scan along the slot array, find the header, check to see whether the, uh, the value for column A could be null, and then do the comparison. So I go fetch this page from disk, now it's in memory, my buffer pool, and I'm, doing the, I'm jumping around you know, from one entry, uh, from one tuple to the next following the slot array to go start processing it. And then now if I want to start computing the aggregate, well then I got to go back and scan through again and maybe jump through through all the C values here. So on, on modern CPUs, this is actually terrible, right? Modern CPUs are, you know, superscalar architectures are designed for, or optimized for, uh, for things that are very sequential and deterministic, meaning I'm gonna scan through the same thing over and over again and not worry about arbitrary jumps in, into memory. I, I, I get better cache locality as, as well. And we'll see how to, how to design scan operators and, and predicates to take advantage of superscalar architectures by remove, removing indirection. But in general here, I, I'm jumping to different locations, and that's going to suck. Right? For this example, it's a simple, it's a one page. Who cares? Again, think always in extremes. If I have a billion pages or a trillion pages, this is not very efficient. Because right? I'm bringing in data also, too, uh, that I don't need. I don't need B5. Right? I don't, sorry, I don't need column B, but I had to bring that data into memory, and I've got to skip over it. Or every every tuple has a header, and I got I got to deal with that. So the row storage model again, it's going to be great for fast updates, inserts, and deletes. It's going to be really good for queries that need the entire tuple. Is that have a question? So, okay, it's great for queries that need the entire tuple because it's all located together in a single page. I go fetch the one page, and it has everything I need. Again, ignoring ignoring overflows. Um, we're not going to discuss this this semester, but it's great for, uh, you can use it for, for index-oriented storage. Like if you store, if you have a B plus tree, like a MySQL NODB, where the leaf nodes are actually the tuples themselves. So you get the clustering effect so that if you do, you can get, you know, do binary search on the leaf nodes and get, get faster performance when you try to find certain, certain keys. But this class, we care about OLAP systems. So it's going to be terrible for scanning large portions of the table uh, when you only need a subset of the attributes because the, the data is going to be sort of jumped. The location of the column you'll be accessing is, is, is spread out across the single page. Um, and you're bringing in other attributes that you don't need for the query. So that's going to pollute your, uh, pollute your buffer pool memory. As we said before, it's bad for memory locality and access patterns because, again, I'm doing these jumping instead of doing sequential, sequential reads. Uh, and then we'll discuss this next week, but this will be terrible for compression because now within a single page, I have a bunch of different uh, data that, that comes from different attributes that are all going to have their diff own different value domains. And I'm not going to be able to exploit re uh, repetition or redundant information and, and compress things. Right? If you ever try to take, think of like a zip file or like a MP4 file, if you try to run zip on it and compress it, it's going to be terrible because it's binary data that doesn't have any, any patterns. So essentially, if, if you intermix all the attributes within a single page, then you're, you're you're essentially getting this, you know, having the same issue. So the solution to this, which we all sort of know about, but let's, look, let's cover more detail, is to do a column store approach or a decomposition storage model. Right? Decomposition store mo storage model is how you would describe it in sort of the academic literature. Nobody really uses the word DSM. People just say column store. But again, when they say column store, they usually mean packs, not the sort of the, the formal definition of, of what a DSM is. See, the idea here with the DSM is that the database system is going to store all the values for a single attribute in a table continuously, one after another. Just think of like a giant array, and here's all the values of column A, and there's another giant array for all the columns, the, all the values in column B. And this is going to be ideal for OLAP workloads where we do read-only queries, and we only need access a subset of the attributes because now we just go get the array, the arrays of the data that we need, the columns of the data that we need, and ignore everything else. And we're going to want to use a batch vectorized uh, processing model um, where as I process the queries or I pro ex execute the operators, instead of passing up one tuple at a time, I'm going to pass a vector of tuples at a time that all correspond to a single column or, or subset of columns. 
And now I'm not paying that penalty called get next, get next, get next on my, on my operators. I'm just moving large chunks of data um, from one operator to the next. So in this world, the files are, again, the, the term file versus page versus chunk versus row group can be all slightly uh, nebulous. But again, assume you, these are like parquet files sitting on S3. The file sizes are going to be much larger than what you would typically have in a row store, right? So like think, of, think of like hundreds of megabytes where like the page size is like tens of megabytes or two, two megabytes or some, some larger size. And then we're, even though that we're going to have um, maybe store these columns as separate files, we still want to organize the tuples in such a way that we can keep track of where they're located uh, by offsets in these files. So I'll show you what it means in the next slide. But all right, so say, say here's our data, right? Same, same table we had before, three columns, six rows. So what we're going to do is we're take all the values from column A and just store those contiguously in, in a single file. Right? Again, there's only six attributes, but again, think of it extremes. Right? You would have this, this, this giant file with maybe a billion entries. So there's going to be some header at the top that just says, here's the, here's the data that, you know, here's about metadata about what's in this file. Again, checksums or what version of the system created it. Now you're going to store also the, a null bitmap separately in the header. So instead of storing it in the header per tuple, right, now you just have this giant bitmap at the top that says, here's for all my you know, 10,000 tuples in this file, here's the bits that are set to true or set to one if the value for that attribute, I get the given tuple, is, is, is null. Right? And then you do the same thing for the next column and the same thing uh, for, for the next column as, as well. Right? So in these examples here, uh, and I'll say this multiple times, I'm showing that the header, like the metadata about what's in the file is in the header. In a, in a mutable file like Parquet or Orc, this is actually in the bottom, in the footer. Right? Because the idea is that you, it's a, you construct the file once, you don't know what's going to be in it until you actually process it and create the file, and then you go and append the, the, the metadata in the footer. Whereas again, in a row store or a system where you're supporting incremental updates, they, you typically put this in the header. But, so for illustrative purposes, I'm showing the header, but real systems will put this in the footer, or Parquet and Orc will put it in the footer. Right, so again, the ba basic idea here is that for every single attribute, we have a separate file and we have, and we have dedicated metadata in, in, in the top to tell you what, what's in it. So one key difference between a row store and a column store is the way we're going to identify tuples. So remember I said in a row store, it's going to be the page ID and then the slot number offset. That's typically how, um, I, think, I can't think of any other system, every, except for in-memory systems, but this is how every sort of disk-based row system is going to work. There may be additional things, like there might be a file ID and an object number, like Oracle and, and, my, and SQL Server have a bit more complicated uh, uh, addressing schemes. But in general, it comes down to a page number and an offset in, in, in the slot array. In a column store, what we're going to instead use is the offset within the column itself. So I say I have, I have 1,000 tuples. I, I know how to jump to the, the header, the location of where, where, the, you know, where our column starts. I know the size of every single attribute. They all have to be fixed length. I'll explain why in a second. Well, this is, this is why. But all the attributes will be, the values will be fixed length. So I know if I want the 500th tuple, I take the size of the attribute times 500, and then I jumped in, into that giant array of, of the column, and that's how I find the data that I'm looking for. So I can do that for any column. So I, if I know how to, if I, if I jump into column A, it's a 500th tuple, I can do the same thing in column B and column C. And this is why all the attributes have to be fixed length. But of course, we know that not uh, oh, every attribute is fixed length, right? I have a text field, a bar char, uh, you know, a binary field, and so forth. Uh, and so we're going to need a way to convert them back into be fixed length. And this is where dictionary compression will come in. Yes? The question is, where, if there's a null value in the middle? So the question is, what if there's a null value in the middle? So you would still, main, you would still reserve the space for that, for that null tuple or null attribute, and then you mark it in the null bitmap. So when you do a lookup now, like you would say, uh, if, say if I'm doing, jumping to an exact tuple, if I want to know what the value is, I could look in the null bitmap, it tells me whether it's null or not, and if it's not, then I go look at it. Right? Okay, so you can just think of this as like vertical partitioning. Right? The reason why it's called the decomposition storage model, because the idea is that you take a, a you know, regular row store table, and you, you do vertical partitioning such that each column is stored in its own one column table. That's, that's the metaphor people use for this. So 
I said that most, as far as I know, every system uh, that I can think of is going to use this, this fixed length offset to, to identify uh, individual tuples. And anyway, we need this for, for stitching things back together later on. Right? As I'm scanning along, if I find, I'm trying to find a match or something, uh, and I, maybe I evaluate the first predicate, and then the second predicate is on the next column, I need to know what are the tuples that match in the first column, and then go to look up their corresponding offsets in the, in the second column. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this. Uh, We'll cover this in a, in a few weeks. But that, that's the basic idea of why we're using this fixed length all sets. So we always know how to jump to within any column to go get all the, all the values we need for any one logical tuple. So as I said, most systems are going to do fixed length all sets. Uh, in, the, in the research literature, there is a discussion about how uh, you could support variable length values. But in a, so instead of actually storing, kept keeping all these things be fixed length, you actually embed the like a, like a tuple ID in the value itself. I think it's like some kind of 32-bit integer. So that way, when I'm you know if I'm at this offset here uh, and I'm looking at tuple two, you have some index or some way to jump into you know, these other columns to get tuple two. This is a special case. I don't remember the system that actually does this. There is I've, I've, this shows up in the literature in some places, but nobody, as far as I know, nobody actually implements it this way. Because right, there's obviously a huge storage overhead of maintaining this, plus the index to then jump into uh, the other columns to get, get the, the, the value you need. Instead, everyone just does these fixed length, fixed length all sets. And as I, I've, I've already said this, but like the, 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 we need to convert any variable length data into fixed length. An obvious trick to do would be just to pad out any, any, you know, any strings with, uh, with spaces at the end to make it fit. Like if, if, if it's a char 16, but most of the time I'm storing uh, you know, eight, eight characters, I just pad out the remaining eight, and that way everything's fixed length. But this obviously is, is wasteful um, and it's expensive because now you're copying data that's actually, you're looking at data and examining data, and that's wasteful, and you gotta, now you do string detection, you got to look for the offsets or look for the padding. So instead, everyone's going to do the dictionary compression stuff. And the idea is that we're going to take anything that's variable length and convert it down into a fixed length integer. Usually 32 bits. Um, again, we'll, we'll discuss how to do this. But basically, think of like, think of a uh, there's 50 states in the United States, or, and so instead of storing the string for all 50 states over and over again, that's variable length. I just convert the, the state into a number, like an enum, and I store the number. That's a very high level explanation, but that's basically what dictionary compression is going to do for us. All right. So I said that column source is not new. So the original idea was actually proposed way back in the 1970s uh, from the Swedish military, in a system called Cantor. Uh, it's, it's in the research literature. I don't think it's, it's gone, it went beyond uh, you know, what, what the prototype they were building. And it wasn't a database system. It was, it was, a, it was actually like a, like, a, like a file system storage uh, approach, or like an object store almost. Um, but the, 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 the paper clearly defines, like, hey, we store things in columns and things are faster. In the 1980s is when they actually proposed on the academic side that formalized the, the, the de decomposition storage model. Uh, it was out there. People really didn't pay attention too much. Um, in the 1990s, Sybase came out with this thing called Sybase IQ, which is an in-memory uh, sort of query accelerator, what we, the fractured mirror approach, we'll see in a second. Basically, they would take the, you had your regular Sybase row store, and they would, they would suck data out and then convert it into a column store. And then your query showed up, they would try to figure out how much can I run on the, on the, on the column store. And then in the 2000s, when this really took off, uh, the PAX paper came out, I think in 2001. Uh, the, there was a C-Store project at, a, at an MIT, but there's a bunch of startups in, in this space, Vertica, Vectorwise, and, and MoneyDB. And then Vectorwise, we're going to see a lot later on in the semester because this is, they, they're the ones that sort of invented the, the Vectorwise execution model, processing model. Um, and they did a lot of the early, the early work in, in using SIMD to accelerate uh, operators. And again, the, the guy that created Vectorwise then became this, was the, the co-founder of Snowflake. And again, a lot of the ideas that were developed in Vectorwise made it into Snowflake. And then by 2010s or 2020s, pretty much everyone is, 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 is a column store now. Because right? it's clearly the, the better way to go. I can't think of any analytical. Uh, there are some systems that are claiming to do real-time analytics. Uh, and they are sort of doing a row store approach, but they, they'll, they'll build column-oriented uh, column indexes. 
What's that? Delete phase. Yeah, we should remove that anyway. Um, <laughs> and then we, this is the old DuckDB logo. We got to update that. Um, anything else added data on this? No. I mean, Impala is still there, but uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, Yes, but it, I mean, it knows how to operate on Parquet data. And yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so like, is it actually a column store database in that it's, it can generate col columnar files? I think it does ingestion. It's on the critical path. Uh, but it's certainly designed around assuming that it's, it's operating on col columnar data. So you would, it'd be fair to say it is a col columnar database system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, what are the pros and cons of this? Well, again, the, the obvious advantage is that we're basically getting. Uh, projection push down for free because we only bring in the data we need for the for the query. We're, like, we're only the attributes of the columns that we need. Um, we're going to get faster query processing because we'll be able to take advantage of the the increased locality and better cache usage of the data we're accessing because again we're ripping through columns and only accessing the columns that we actually need and not not having to jump around over over stuff we don't. And then again we'll we'll get better compression because. All the values within a column, for the most part, are going to be very similar to each other. I just think of like, again, you can think timestamps, right? Some 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 event stream. The timestamps there are one second off for each other. So that means there's there'll be a lot of redundant data from one one tick to the next, and we we can exploit that and get better compression. The downside is going to be that it's going to be slow for point queries. Uh, things that, things that have to go grab a single tuple. Uh, anytime you can do insert updates and deletes, assuming your system supports that, and all, all of them do. Because um, now we got to take tuples that were that you know that come in from the application as a row store, and then split it up and store it in separate columns, or now we got to take the columns and, put, and the, the, the separated data and put it back together, stitch it back together, and re return that to the client. And anytime we have to reorganize things, then that's that's always expensive. Like we won't go into this too much, but there are some systems they would they would sort all the data in your columns, and so now anytime I insert something that maybe lands in the middle of of, of my sort order. I got to move things around to make space for it. And that, that, that gets expensive. All right, so this sounds great. So the DSM seems like what we want to use, except that we know, as I, as I already said in the last slide, like there's a penalty we're paying for having the extreme case of everything separated from everything else. Like it, you're restoring the columns in completely separate files. Because most queries in OLAP setting aren't going to be going only accessing a single column. Right? Very rarely you're going to say like it's you know select ID from table foo where ID equals something right like or ID greater than this like it's very rare that that that, that a OLAP query would only look at a single column in isolation. So that means at some point as we execute the query we're going to have to go back, get the other attributes for for all the tuples that are matching our predicates as we're, as we're going from one operator to the next, and then stitch the tuple back together. In the paper you guys read they discuss this as you want to do this as late as possible. And this is the late materialization technique. But you still need, at some point, you still need to do this. So the ideal is that we want to get the benefits of the columnar storage for compression and execution reasons. But then we also want to be able to take advantage of, the, of having data that's related to each other, close to each other, uh, maybe not exactly on the same page, but at least nearby, so that we can not have to go a bunch of more random I.O. to go put things back together. So we want to we want a columnar scheme that gets again the separation, but have things at least be again relatively close to each other. So this is what PAX is. PAX stands for Partition Attributes Across. Uh, this came out in 2002. Uh, this was invented here at CMU by Natasha Alamaki, who used to be the data professor at CMU, and then she left to go to uh, EPFL in Switzerland. I am here because she left. Uh, it's not entirely all of it, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, it's the reason why the last time this class was taught before I re revived it at 721 was like 2006 because of her. Um, she's great. So again, as I said, this is going to be, this will be still called as a columnar storage format. This is what Parquet is. This is what ORC is. This is what basically Carbon Data is. This is what most people say when they have a columnar database. It's actually PAX. But this, you know, it's outside of academia, it's maybe, maybe it's less well known. So the idea here, again, the goal is that we want to have the, the faster processing benefits of kilometer storage, but then maintain the spatial locality of having data that's close to each other, uh, that's related to each other, that's part of the same tuple, uh, physically close to each other. So the idea looks like this. So now, we're not going to break things up into uh, separate files, separate pages. Assume that there's a single file. 
And so first we're going to do, we're going to horizontally partition the rows. Could be on some, some, some key, some attribute. Could just be the insertion order within, you know, they arrived in the system. It doesn't matter for now. And so we're going to take all of the data that's in maybe the first uh, two, three rows, and we're going to put them together where all the attributes for the first column are contiguous, all the attributes of the second column are contiguous, and then the last one as well. I'm going to call this a, a row group. And every row group is going to have its own header that says things about like what compression scheme they're using, where to find the offsets for uh, you know, these different columns. And again, don't think of a row group as a single page. Uh, right? in, 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 like, in, in this world, these files are usually quite large. Right? So the, like a row group could be like 100 megs. And then within a, and within a row group, you have of, the data for a single column. That could be broken up into multiple pages. Or I think uh, Parquet calls them chunks. Right, and you do, do you do the same thing for now for the, uh, for the, for the, next, for the next row group, all right? And then, again, as I said before, in, in immutable file formats like Parquet, the header would actually be in the footer, but this is going to contain information about, look, here's the location of the row groups, here's the, maybe check some for the file, uh, and, and any other global metadata. But the metadata about what's actually in the tuples themselves, the attributes themselves, that'll be tied to, to the row group. Yes? This question is, uh, the, how, do I meet, how do I still get the benefit of, of locality if the, if, the, if the columns may be contiguous, but the, within a single tubo, the, 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 the columns themselves are, are, are still separated? Because it's still close enough, right? It's not like comp completely two separate files. Yes? Her question is, has someone determined the optimal size for a row group? Uh, it's funny you mention this. Um, my former student, uh, Huan Chen, who I co-advised with, with Dave Anderson, he's now at Xinhua. Uh, we are actually working on the survey now, looking at Parquet and Oric and understanding the pros and cons. And we have found that in a modern systems with modern like network hardware, like the speeds, the defaults are actually terrible. Oh. Uh, the defaults are actually too small. Yeah. Um, because again, these, these file formats were designed 2011, 2012, 13. Yeah. The networks have gotten way faster, right? CPUs haven't gotten that much faster, but the network and disk have gotten way faster. So we, we won't talk about this in this, this class, but like, you can also then take this PAX file and then it'll run, you can, it'll run like snappy or Z standard compression uh -huh. on it. But it turns out again, if, if this, your disk is really fast, you don't want to do that because the CPU cost of decompressing it, uh, is not worth the benefit because you, know, you, can, you can suck it in way faster than, than you used to. So this is not maybe the best way to do this. Well, hold on. This is the best way to do this. There's, there's a lot of studies on this showing that you, that you get the benefit of the cache locality and as, all the things I've saying before, but exactly what these parameters are, how long these strides should be, the chunk sizes, all that depends on a lot of things. Parquet is also more heavyweight with compression, I think. They, do, they have... Uh, the compression scheme is way more complicated than ORC, uh -huh. and sometimes simplicity is just better. Oh. Yeah. OK, uh, I think I've said everything here, right? Yeah. So again, the, the, every row group has its own metadata. And again, we're not going to go discuss exactly, here's how Parquet does, here as ORC how works. Uh, but if you go, you know, there, there's, there's a bunch of talks where they basically describe the same thing I'm describing here. Right, so this is from Databricks of how what Parquet, uh, what Parquet looks like. Right here, here we go. The row group, they says default 128, and the page size is one megabyte. Is that the best? It depends. But for faster hardware, no. All right, so we're not going to discuss the buffer pool side of this in class, or th this semester, because we're just going to use all the same stuff we talked about in the intro class. At the end of the day, like, there's stuff on disk. you got to go bring it into memory. And it's, you don't want to use MMAP as I've said multiple times, right? <laughs> we want to manage this stuff ourselves, right? But underneath the covers, like what, what is, if we malloc something, what is actually is that? It is, I mean, it is anonymous MMAP, um, but we're not letting the OS decide what, what gets evicted. So all the things about like LRUK or ARC or you know, preventing from issues with sequential flooding, all that still applies here. The thing I do want to talk about is uh, because we are in an OLAP setting and we are trying to bring in larger page sizes than we would in a row store, what does that actually look like underneath the covers at the hardware level? Right? 
So the deep, what's the default size in hardware? In, in, sorry, what's the default memory page size in Linux? Four kilobytes. Why? Because that's what Intel decided for x86 in 1985, right? Um, there's been attempts to try to have larger page sizes. I think ARM tried to do this with 64 kilobyte page sizes. But then it broke a bunch of stuff that it was assuming 4 kilobytes, so they had to roll it back in Linux. So the reason why this is bad, because if we're now reading really large files, really large chunks of, chunks of data, and we're going to want to rip through that as quickly as possible, then having the, the, the operating system, the hardware, keep track of these little 4 kilobyte sort of pages, even though the block of data we're reading might be 100 megabytes, uh, is going to be expensive because in the TLB, the translation local side buffer inside on the hardware, it only has so many entries. Uh, so to, you know, to bring, I think the, the, the fastest, the smallest cache at the first level, it's like you have 72, 72 entries for your TLB. So it's really hard to bring all that in and then and update your TLB if you're going at four kilobyte page sizes, right? Uh, question? Yes. So you can always configure the machine to have huge pages. Next slide, give me a sec. Yes. <laughs> this, this, he said, can't you always configure this machine to use huge pages? Yes, this is where we're going. Yes. All right. So, well, he's, well he ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So, huge pages. So, instead of allocating four kilobyte pages, uh, you can turn on huge pages in Linux, and you can get uh, larger page sizes. I think it starts off with two megs, and you go up to one gig. And so, when this first came out, this was touted as this huge improvement because, like I said, we have larger memory machines, we're reading large data sets. Uh, this is going to be way more efficient. So the way it works is that you would allocate memory just like you normally would uh, with transparent huge pages. And then underneath the covers, Linux would try to identify, oh, these pages can be combined together into larger page sizes. Uh, and and then, then you have you know, fewer entries in your TLB. Right? So the, the way it works is that the pages that have to be contiguous that have identified, oh, I've malloced you know, these contiguous pages that are physically close to each other. I can just combine them together and then use a single reference or, or TLB entry for them, right? So the, the OS is going to try to do this in the background, right? So it wants to keep things compact, right? It wants, wants, wants to uh, reduce fragmentation. So it's going to look for maybe pages that can maybe split up to larger to smaller page sizes and then combine them together and reorganize, right? The downside of this is that when this is happening, this is now a kernel thread that's going to block uh, the, the, the database system when it tries to access one of these pages if it's starting to move things around. Right? Because again, there's, this, there's virtual memory that's mapping, there's a mapping from virtual memory to physical memory. So it can prevent you from accessing virtual memory if it's changing where that, where that physical memory is actually backed from, or, or what, 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 what that virtual memory is backed by, like what, what region of memory. Right? So when transparent huge pages first came out, uh, all the database systems basically would tell you, turn this off. This is a terrible idea. It's all in the documentation uh, and all these links here to go look at it. Everybody tells you to the, turn this off, right? Because the performance overhead of random stalls because the OS starts, starts compacting your memory is terrible, right? The only system that I'm aware of, that at least I can find uh, in, in a more recent search, was Vertica. They tell you you can turn this on, but only for some new version of Red Hat or CentOS, where it somehow it's been, it's, it's been fixed. So historically, database systems, even though we're, especially in OLAP systems, even though we're reading larger page sizes or larger blocks of data, uh, they don't want you to use the, the huge page mechanisms in, in the database system because the, cause, cause of all these you know, penalties for the, the OS is doing stuff that we don't want it to do, we don't, or the system's not aware of. So more recently, though, there is research that seems to suggest that having a version of malloc that is aware of these huge pages and, and trying to allocate for them uh, can, get a, you know, can actually get a, uh, make a huge difference. So Google has a paper from, I think, 2021 where they turn on huge pages in TC malloc. It's their version of malloc. And across their entire uh, data center for all the workloads, they saw a 7% improvement. Um, and then for explicitly for Spanner, which is a transactional system, not an OLAP system, they saw almost a 6.5% improvement. So it seems like this would be a big win. The current research literature suggests that it is not, at least, sorry, it's not research, it's the, 
basically all the blog articles and much, a bunch of uh, benchmarking people have done for existing database systems seems to suggest huge pages aren't the way to go. Um, but the, the Google paper suggests that it's worth reconsidering. And there's a blog article written uh, actually last week by a friend of mine um, where he basically says, hey, this is something we, we need to reconsider in the context of databases. Because clearly this is what we should be you know, using. right? This is a no-brainer. But as far as I know, no database system uh, can, can do this uh, natively and, and, and reap the benefits of it. I think you can turn this on in JVM. I think you can turn this, turn this on in Go. Uh, but again, I, I haven't seen anything that suggests like all the OLAP systems we talked about before, you get the benefit. Yes? Okay, so what changed when you say don't enable large pages, but then now enable it? His question is what has changed in, what has changed in the last couple of years that, 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 that suggests that you could turn this on when, before you could? Because the, the, the background compaction stuff is now less aggressive, uh, and it, it, it stalls less. Yes? How difficult is it to implement this? How, the question is, how difficult is it to implement this? I mean, you just you, you call mAdvise and tell it to use huge pages, and that's it. Is that, is that enough? No. But that's how, that's how easy it is to do. Uh, but like I said, like, the data system needs to be aware that it's maybe using huge pages and uh, maybe configures its memory allocations to uh, be aware that I'm allocating two megabytes a block that, it can be, that are going to be contiguous or something like that, instead of like you know four kilobyte chunks over and over again. Yes. Okay, I don't know if you can answer this question. It's a trial question. But what's the point of implementing huge pages, like so from an OS perspective? The question is, what is the point of implementing huge pages from an OS perspective? Uh, I mean, the benefit is obvious, right? Like it's it's yeah, the TLB. TLB is like super small. Yeah, but like. Like. Uh, yeah. Like it's, it's like L1, L2, L3. Like actually, it is L1, L2. What's, what's that? It's a brain dead question. Ignore me. No, no, it's not a brain dead question. It's like, the question is like, why, why do we want this? Because again, in an OLAP system, we're reading terabytes of data potentially for a single query. I mean, yeah, for an OLAP system, I understand. But like? For the general unwashed masses? For yeah. like, for, for like yeah. wait, for random programs or JavaScript programs? <laughs> no, that's an honest question. What is again regularly what like? like, stop. like just, just Abby, you're a database. Abby, computer user. Again, like. Stop uh, if you have to allocate memory, and the memory you need to allocate is is going to be contiguous, yeah. then you want this. Yeah. If I'm doing a bunch of small little object allocations in random locations, yeah, this doesn't help you. Okay. You don't, you don't want this. But again, what are we doing databases? We're reading large, we allocate a large <laughs> chunks of memory to read large contiguous data. I know it's not a stupid question. I mean, like, it's good to think of. Like, again, this is like, it, it's a good, this is why like, you have to think about, you don't want to think about the, what the data set looks like, what the query looks like, what the workload looks like. Uh, and you can design, if you design a system for the OLAP you know, workload patterns, you can take advantage of these things. This doesn't make sense in, in, uh, for OTP workloads, where you're going, again, doing random updates on random locations through small amounts of data. OK. Right, I, to his question about, about like, what, it, what it has changed, um, it used to, again, if, if, if it has to figure out where to go do compaction, the old days would take like seconds. Uh, and the new one, it, like, uh, in the newer versions, I actually think, think like version 4 in the kernel, like, if it can't find anything right away, then it backs off. Whereas before it would like it would like lock everything stall. Okay. All right. So let's talk about how we actually want to represent data. So this is this is basically the same thing we talk about in the intro class. So there's nothing really uh, dramatically different here. For for a bunch of you know primitive types like integers, big ints, and, and floats and reals, we'll just use what's in the IEEE uh, 754 standard. Right? This is a standard that defines what the how hardware or CPU manufacturers will represent these low, low you know, data types, low-level data types, like integers. You can think of, like, I allocate a variable in C++ for an integer. It's going to be 32 bits. The hardware defines, the this, this standard defines how the hardware should actually represent it. And there'll be instructions and registers that actually store, store this data accordingly. For timestamps, uh, depending or not you, whether you want the time zone, uh, but typically it's going to be a 32-bit or 64-bit integer. That'll be some number of, of a unit of measurement since the Unix epoch. 
is, is the most simplest way to do this. For uh, variable length fields like var chars, var binaries, text and blobs, if the value is less than 64 bits, you can just inline it. Otherwise, again, you'll have a reference to some other, some other, some other off, uh, overflow storage, uh, whether it's in disk or in memory, to where to go find it. And again, most systems are going to use dictionary compression for, for var chars uh, to, to make things fixed length. Or the address itself to the offload storage, overflow storage will be, will be fixed length. Uh, the one I, the interesting thing I do want to spend time on is talking about uh, decimals. And there's basically two approaches. Right? You can have variable precision or uh, uh, fixed point precision. Or, and the idea is that, like, do we want to have let the harbor handle, handle the decimals for us, or do we want the database system manage it for us? And the trade-off is going to be if we, if we let, the, let the harbor manage it, as defined by the 754 standard for either a 32-bit or 64-bit floating, floating point number, um, it's going to be faster because the hardware can support it natively. Right? There'll be instruction that take you know, two floats and add them together. Didn't always used to be that case. That, that came out in the 90s with floating point you know, units in, in the CPUs. But now every, every modern CPU has it. But the problem is, of course, is going to be that they don't guarantee exact values. So I wanted to write this in, in Rust for Chi, but I didn't have time. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's the same amount of code. Um, Right, so here we have a simple C program. We take two floating point numbers. We have 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. We're going to add them together and print it out. Right? And what do you get? Well, you get what you expect. Right, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 equals 0 0.3. But is this, is this actually what's going on? No. If I make it print out all the, 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 uh, the values, right? I don't round it off, and you see you get something like this. right? Why is this happening? Again, because the, the 754 standard doesn't define how to store exact values for floating point numbers. Right? So, so if you actually look at what's within the bits are being stored, uh, you get something like this. Is this OK? Depends, exactly, right. Again, that's the answer for most everything in databases. <laughs> is this going to be fast? It depends. Is this the right way to do this? It depends, right? It depends, right? If it's my. If it's the temperature in my office and I'm, you know, have a sensor every 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 one minute, then yeah, who cares, right? If it's like a scientific instrument, like trying to land something on Mars, I probably don't want to have these rounding errors because <laughs> at large scale it's going to be problematic. So the way to handle this, oops, sorry, nope. the way to handle this is, is what's called fixed point precision numbers, and the idea here is that this is a this is a data type that's implemented in the data system itself, not in the hardware where we can, we can manage the, the exact precision and scale of an integer, or sorry, of a, of, a, of a decimal without any rounding errors. So the SQL standard, you would define this for 30 bits would be numeric or, or decimal. Uh, sometimes in some systems, they're just alias for each other. And again, this, is a, this, is, this, is, this data type is implemented differently per database system. Right? It's not something that, like, again, there's a, the SQL standard specifies how to do it. The SQL standard, standard specifies the behavior you should have these data types. But how you actually implement it is different from uh, one system from the next. In the case of actually Oracle, I don't think uh, you can get the, well, you can actually get the, the, the variable length precision, the floating point numbers. But if you say, I want a float or a real, you actually get these. Right? You get the, the fixed point uh, numbers. Because the, their idea is that the, uh, just avoid any problems with rounding errors, force everyone to use the fixed point one. And they'll, 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 they made it fast enough that, that you can't really tell. Um, there is a way I think you can, you can specify, I, I want exactly the, the, variable, variable, the variable length one or the, the variable precision one. All right, so the basic idea is that uh, we're, we're going to store some kind of varchar or a byte stream of the value, and then we're going to have some extra metadata to say where the decimal point is, what the scale is, and so forth. So if you want to support arbitrary precision, meaning like the, the decimal point can appear uh, in different locations from one, one value to the next within a single column, then you gotta, there's some extra metadata you've got to store uh, you know, within the tuple itself to keep track of that. If you don't need to support that, where you know, every single value has to have the decimal point in the exact same location, you can go way, way, way faster. So we had a project on this a, a few years ago. Uh, on a library called libfixypointy, um, was when we were building a noise page, we built our decimal type from uh, inspired by the Germans, which we'll cover in, later on, 
well, they're people. We don't have to cover that. <laughs> but like in, in the umbra or in uh, in hyper, the the head German there sort of told us how to do this. Thomas Neumann, yes, told us how to do this, and he's not the head German, but he's the best German. Um, he told us how to do this, but they can't open source the code, and I had a student start implementing it. We, so we have an implementation of this. Just, I need someone to help work with me to fix this library up, and they, we could try it out in Postgres. Um, so this could be a, a potential project. The math works. It's super hard. It's a lot of like bit shifting um, to make it work, but the performance is, is quite good. All right, so let's quickly look at what Postgres does. So this is their numeric type. This is the actual code of Postgres. And so as you see, we don't need to go, we don't, we're not going to go into detail all these things, but here's a bunch of metadata. They have to store four integers per value plus this uh, numeric digits uh, array, which is just a, uh, an alias up to uh, unsigned char. So, so you take whatever the size of this is, which is now variable length, uh, and then with uh, was 16 bytes here, just to store one value. So this is pretty heavyweight. And then if you go look at the extra source code here, this is how they do uh, you know, this is adding two numerics together. So you got to check whether one's null, got to check whether one's uh, positive or negative, like this giant switch statement here. There's a lot of work you have to do to make sure that you end up with exact values. And it's not a Postgres thing. Here's MySQL. Basically the same thing, right? A bunch of metadata, right? And then you have this, uh, this decimal digit thing as an alias up to this, which is just uh, an array of 32-bit 32, 32 32 integers. And then they have their own add function, right? Again, so think of this. To add two numerics together, I got to invoke all this code versus a single instruction to take a floating point number and add the two together. So again, you pay the penalty to have exact precision. Uh, but in, in again, if it's your bank account or scientific instruments, you would care. So now let's talk about nulls. Uh, the, the way basically everyone's going to do it is this one here, the second one. You have a, you have a header somewhere. That there's a bitmap, and a bit is set to 1 if the attribute at that offset in, in the column is, is, is null. But isn't the only way to do it. Another approach to do is, if you really care about storage space, is to use actually a special value in the domain of, a, of an attribute or the type to represent null. So that you, you typically see this in, uh, in memory systems, because you, you don't want to maybe pay the penalty or the, the, the memory overhead of of maintaining this bitmap. So you just say, all right, int32, uh, the minimum value of int32 defined by the C, uh, libc, that's going to be my, my null. You make sure nobody can insert that value. You just make the, you know, the total possible values you can store one, one, smaller by one. So VoltDB does this. Uh, there's a couple other in-memory systems that do this. The dumbest idea is choice three, uh, where similar to the tuple ID that you would, you would embed in the we talk about column stores, you actually embed a flag for every single value that could be null to determine whether it is null. Right? So this obviously, you know, even though the flag only needs to be a single bit, you can't store it as a single bit because you have to worry about a word alignment or cache alignment. Right? I can't just have, I mean, you can, but it's a bad idea. You, can't, you don't want to define a data type that's 33 bits because the hardware isn't set up for that. So when you go try to read 32 bits, you're actually going to read 64 bits. Even larger because it's a cache line, but we, we can ignore that. So this is actually, you know, well, well, it's a spoiler. You think it's so terrible, who would ever actually do this? MemSQL used to, right? And this is the old documentation. They've since fi fixed this. Uh, but when you go look at their, their, their integer types, they would tell you the size of each, of each type, and they would have the size if it can't be null. Sorry, the size if it could be null, and the size if it, if it can't be null, right? So for a Boolean, which is just you know, 1 or 0, if it's not null, then it's 1 byte. But if it could be null, then they have to store that as uh, 2 bytes. All right? Big int, you go from 8 bytes up to 12 bytes. And they're doing this because they, they worry about you know, uh, word alignment of the data that they're accessing. And that goes back to why, and in addition to why we want to have fixed length values so that we can jump to offsets more easily, it's also going to ensure that all our data is, is nicely memory aligned. So that we don't try to access a tuple that is, or a value that maybe spread across two cache lines, because now that's two cache reads uh, instead of one. All right? So don't do this, but it does exist. Yeah. So I debate whether to show you this, like, hey, here's a stupid idea. Don't do this, but now you know about it. So like, 
Is that, is that a good idea? OK. All right, so we've covered COM stores. We've covered the pack stuff. We've covered what the actual bits are going to look like for integer values. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what, how to handle updates if you want to do that. So data is considered hot when it first enters the database system. This is just in general, not just for OLAP systems, but like think about your, in your own life. Like when you go to, I don't know, Twitter or TikTok, whatever the hottest, be real, whatever. <laughs> yes. Uh, OnlyFans, whatever. Like you go look at the latest things. You don't go back eight months, 12 months, you know, 24 months and look at those things. So when data first enters the database, it's more likely to be accessed. Uh, it's also more likely to be you know, read and also potentially updated. Right? So, and then over time, as it, uh, as it grows colder, it's less likely to be accessed. You may you know, only start using for read-only queries. So we may want to organize our system in such a way that new data is, is stored in a, in, a, in a way that can be very efficient for you know, quick access, for maybe for OTP kind of queries. And then over time, we want to migrate it to a, a, a colder storage system. So this is what sort of the hybrid storage model is. Um, and the basic idea is that we want to have two execution engines, essentially two database systems that are linked together that maybe store things in a row store for, for updates, for, for hot data, and then a column store for, for colder data. And then over time, as things get cold, as the data gets cold, right, either through like a, a expiration process or by observing the workload patterns on it, we then migrate it to the column store. And we can do this in a batched, form, uh, in a batched way, and this is why we can then combine a bunch of data together, put it together, put it, you know, store it in a single file, like a parquet file or work file, and then do all the compression stuff we want to do all together, rather than trying to do things incrementally. So the two approaches you'll see in your life are fractured mirrors and delta store. Fractured mirrors, I think I've already mentioned. But the, the delta store approach would be what, what any system that, that's supporting uh, Databricks has their lake house term, or they, they, this thing called delta lake. This is, this is essentially what they're doing. But the idea is they want to have a, a, a separate storage for, for new updates. And then over time, it then migrates or percolates into the the column store. So again, we just go through these at high level just, just so you're aware of that, what they are. So fracture mirrors come from, comes from an idea from uh, 2002. Uh, and the idea is that we're basically going to store a second copy of the database in a column store that will be automatically updated, as, as I said. So you have your row store. That's, that's the primary copy of the database. And then you have this mirror copy um, in the DSM. And if this thing dies, if this thing crashes, goes away, who cares? Because right? this is considered the, the, the source of truth, the, the, the database of record for, for our database. So we, we can't lose this. If we lose this, we'll just rebuild it from this. So all your transactions come along. They're always going to operate directly on, on the row store data, because that, again, that'll be optimized for, for fast updates. And then uh, we'll propagate things to the, row, to the column store. And then we'll assume any anal analytical query uh, gets applied here. Right? And of course, the if someone then updates something that's, that's in a copied over here, you need a way to keep track of that so that any analytical query knows that it has to go fetch the newer data uh, from this side. All right. The delta store is probably the more common approach these days. All right, so I would say also this is this is only used in uh, this is used in in Oracle's it has an in-memory columnar accelerator. Uh, SQL Server is hard to keep track of, but they have a bunch of different versions of SQL Server. I think they have a OLAP index or Apollo engine that uses this. IBM Blue is or DB2 Blue is their, their you know column store accelerator. Like this approach is more common in systems, in older legacy systems that already have a huge uh, you know infrastructure and ecosystem around the, around the row store. Then rather than making a whole separate column store system, they graph this thing on so they get the advantage of, of the existing tooling, and then people still get the benefit of, of the column store. So it's an engineering slash sort of business decision to go, to go with this approach. With the delta store, the idea is that again, just like before, we have the uh, we have our, our front end uh, row store. All the updates are going to go in here, and then over time, as things get colder, we then will migrate it to the uh, historical data set the in the column store. And so a tuple can only exist. The the the, the source of truth of for the the most recent version of a tuple can only exist in, in one of these two. So as I, as, I, as I propagate it into the column store, I essentially remove it from the row store. Because why, why waste the space if I already have a copy over there? 
So now again, transactions come along, you, you update the column store, sorry, the row store, and then any analytical query comes along, you have to go figure out is the data you want in, in either one of these and then merge the results together. Or again, if I update a tuple that I've already migrated, I need a way to keep track of that and validate it here and make sure that I know that I'm reading the latest version over there. So is like the underlying assumption here that the analytical queries are okay with full state of data? Or is it? His question is, is it is, is there an underlying assumption here that the analytical queries are okay with old stale data? No. Um, well, most systems will, will most systems will, will make a trade-off between um, freshness and, and timeliness of the data and, and performance. Like if I, if I care about having the most latest data in my analytical queries, then I got to go, go look in here. Same thing with the other approach. Uh, but then I pay that penalty to go parse that out of the, of the row store, right? If I don't care, then I, maybe I just run over the, you know, the, only on the historical data here. Uh, the Napa system from Google, uh, they gave a talk with us last year, and there's a paper uh, which I'm not going to cover this semester, but they make the trade-off of, of, of performance plus timeliness or freshness plus, uh, plus cost because th for internal reasons at Google. But it's, it's, it's the same idea. Again, I, I, can, I, can get, I can get better performance, but if I'm going to pay for it, and potentially also get the, but it, it's hard to trade it off against getting the, the having the latest data. Because not having to go read this is, 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 is much better. Yes? Uh, does this mean that the application query has to store like, what, what data is on each? Her question is, does, does this mean the application have to mean to keep track of where, where, where is data, like what, what side of this? No, the idea is that the system, the data system, they consider this all this the database system whether or not it's two separate products or whatever, think of this as the data system. It's responsible for keeping track of where, where is what, what is where. And for also keeping track of like, okay, when should I move things? Now, the administrator could define like, okay, if the data is older than five days, then move it over, or has been touched in a week, then move it over. There's some systems that support those kind of rules uh, to move things, um, but the data system is responsible for facilitating the movement of things. Yes? His question is, is this faster than fractured mirrors? It depends on the implementation. Yeah, so, like, so this one, you're basically storing two copies of the, of the entire database. Um, now, you, you can compress the hell out of this, and so it's, that's an issue. But this is basically, think of this approach as like, it's like an index. Like this is an auxiliary copy of the database that I have to maintain. can make sure it is in sync with this thing. But it's another copy. With this is one tool only exists in either location. Now, there may be a period where I update something here if, if, if the system allows it, and I still have the old version here, and it, only later, once I do compaction or whatever, then it gets, gets, gets pruned out. Um, but the, yeah, the amount of space of the store, the, 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 this is, it takes more space because you're maintaining two copies than this one. Yes? Is there any reason that both of these methods have like one like, uh, row store and one column store? The question is, is there any reason why these, both of these methods have one row store and one column store, uh, as, as opposed to what, like multiple tiers, or? Like using both, like using like one, like I guess. A sing, a, store. Could you have a single system that supports both, like both a row store and a column store? No, it's more like, you know, this is like Delta store, right? So you like store like historical data and like column store, and then you store like the Delta store data and like a row store. But why can't like the Delta store data also be stored? Question is why can't you store? Does that make yeah, sense? yeah. So we're not going to cover this. Um, uh -oh. No, no. So, so, so the question is why couldn't you have? A, basically, you're asking why couldn't you have a column store do fast transactions, right? And the only system single store kind of does that, but like the Delta store is like a depend log, so it's sort of the same okay. thing. Um, but it's within a you know a single system, uh -huh. uh, and so it's transparent to you. Hyper is the only system I can think of that did. It did transactions directly on the column store, but because it's doing multi-versioning, it's storing delta records. Okay. So if I have a bunch of, of, of deltas I'm updating for MVCC, technically it's a row store. Okay. All right. uh, one quick question. Like, uh, in both of these cases, we're not assuming packs as anywhere. His question is, in both of these cases, we're not assuming packs as anywhere. No, assume this is packs. Oh. I say DSM, but column store packs. Again, for the purposes of going for the rest of the semester, when I say column store, I'm going to mean packs. So yeah, 
I should put column store here to be more generic. OK, uh, so we have two minutes left, although Phil stole, stole our time. Um, what time. Oh, shit, never mind. Let's keep going. Databases. Thank you. <laughs> Last semester was ending at, 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 at 10 after. OK, thank you. All right, so um, I want to briefly talk about uh, partitioning. We're not going to go into details of how to actually partition, meaning like how do I pick the right columns or, or attributes to split my data on, um, because that, that's an MP-complete problem, and, and we don't spend too much time on that. But, but as as, again, talking at the lowest level, the physical level, how are we actually going to do partitioning? So the idea here is, again, we want to split the database up across multiple resources so that we can take advantage of, of parallelism. Um, and so even though I showed, when, when we talk about packs, there's a single file and there's these row groups. You can part do horizontal partition within the row group. There's nothing that says a single machine has to operate on that, on that file, the entirety of the file. You could, could split things up further. Um, most systems don't do that, but like, there's nothing you could. The idea is basically the same. Like you, you could split things across the file, and then within the file, you, you split it up uh, again. But we, we can ignore that. So in the NoSQL world, they're going to call this sharding. sharding. Uh, in the academic world, we would say partitioning. But again, the high, basic high, in the end, and then the, 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 they're, they're both talking about horizontal partitioning. So when we have partitioned data, uh, when, we, when we start executing the query, we're going to break the query plan up to fragments and run those in parallel. And at some point, we need to coalesce the results the different fragments, the query fragments are working on to produce a final answer to, to the user. Right? Someone's writing, sends a SQL query through, like, through the, Snowflake, you know, uh, the Snowflake browser uh, tool or like, from the command line. We need to come back with a single result. So we have to go, even though things are partitioned, we've got to put it back together. So the data system is going to be able to partition up physically uh, in, in a shared nothing system, we're actually moving data and separating from, from each other. Again, not specific to shared, shared nothing. You could you know, do partitioning within different files in a, sh in a shared disk system, but we can ignore that for now. Or logically, in a shared disk system where, again, it's a single shared, shared location, or shared, but shared files in a shared disk system, but then we assign different nodes to operate on either separate files or, or different offsets within the file. And you saw this in the Snowflake paper from last week where they talk about how to use consistent hashing, so they assign a worker node to one, to one file that, that's out in, in their storage. And then if they add a new node, they, 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 they do consistent hashing. They're, they're reorganized to make another node now be responsible for that file without having to, re having to reshuffle that. The idea is the same. They're doing horizontal partitioning. So what we want to do here is that we want to take a table of tuples, and we're going to split them up into disjoint subsets uh, based on some partitioning key or some partitioning column based on some, some objective function that we're trying to optimize for. Like, we want to prove joins. We want to prove uh, data locality for doing scans or something. For our purposes here, it doesn't matter. And then partitioning scheme is going to say how we're going to divide things up. So hash partitioning is going to be the most common one. There's some hash function. You take the attribute, uh, you hash it, and then you mod it by the number of partitions you have, and you sign it to a node that way. Range partitioning, if you know the values ahead of time, you, 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 the, the, range ahead of the, the ranges ahead of time you can split up that way. And then predicate partitioning, we're not going to really talk about, but that would be, I could define a where clause to say, uh, to determine whether something should be in a partition or not. So the basic idea looks like this. So we have a table, and we have uh, four columns. And say we pick this one as our partitioning key. So if we're doing hash partitioning, we just take the value that, that's in each, for each tuple, hash it, Modify the number of partitions we have. I'm showing these as databases, but it could be files. It could be uh, different nodes. It doesn't matter. And then the value of this, this hash, hashing function, after, after modding it, that determines where the data is going to be located. So now if I come along, and the most, this obvious example would be if I have a, uh, a query that wants to do a single lookup on one, one tuple based on this partitioning key, I know exactly where to go find it. All right? And I don't have to do any, any data movement. Uh, I don't have to do any reshuffling. When we talk about joins and other things, that's obviously not always going to be the case because I'm not always guaranteed to join on the thing I partitioned on. Snowflake talks about, I don't forget where the paper, the paper talks about micropartitioning, but we'll see this later in, in the semester. Um, Redshift does this too. They try to do some, some automatic reorganization in the background based on how you're joining tables together to maybe try to, try to partition it so that uh, the data from two tables are, are, are partitioned on the same join key 
so the data is lo local to each other. But again, we'll cover this later. So with logical partitioning, it's the snowflake approach where I don't actually move data to a, a physical node. I just say what, what node is responsible for operating on, on the data in the shared disk storage. So again, really simple partitioning. I'm doing range partitioning. So the top guy here gets one and two. The bottom node gets three and four. So best case scenario, I have a query shows up and it says I want to get where ID equals one. I, it goes to the shared disk system and I, I know where to route it and I know that this, this thing, this node here can uh, produce the result. Same thing here, get, get three, can move like this. But if I have a query that wants to maybe do get three and two, then I can make a decision whether to push the query fragment up here and then get the result back or copy the, 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 the value down. Right? It, it depends on the implementation. And that's that push the query to the data versus, sorry, push the, yeah, push, okay, push the data to the query versus, no. Push the query to the data versus pull the data to the query. Okay, that's that design decision that we talked about last class. Yes? Yeah, so, so his question is, but I'm not showing here, how does this thing know to go here? Yes, you would have some kind of middleware system in front of this. I think Snowflake calls it the, what it, it had some name, but like, yeah, there'll be something up here that you submit the query to, and then it says, it looks in the catalog and says, I know where three and two is located, so I, it can make a decision, should I go here or not, Wait, right? So, so his statement is, uh, you could break the query into two parts, and then coalesce the results on that front end node. It depends on whether that front end node is like a, just, a, just a, a router or it actually is, is, a, is a worker in itself and can actually do some kind of computation. Again, for our purposes here, like it, does, it doesn't matter yet. It just, and so for physical partition, again, because it's a shared nothing system, it has its own local, local disk and that's where, that's where it's you know, shard or partition of the data is stored. So when a query shows up, uh, it knows how to route it uh, accordingly. Again, this is the idea of horizontal partitioning. It's, it not just applies for O2B workloads. Uh, we need it for OLAP because this end of the day, it's going to be for the joins and making sure things are partitioned on the same join key. All right, so to finish up. So as I said multiple times, every modern OLAP system today that says they're a column store, uh, well, if they're, they're not a column store, they're out of business. I can't imagine anyone. But um, every OLAP system that says they're a column store is going to be using PACs. Um, and the key idea about PACs is that all the data is going to be, has to be fixed length. The key idea in a column store, but especially in PACs as well, is that all the data needs to be fixed length. And if it's not fixed length, we need to use some method to convert it into a fixed length value so that we can jump to offsets uh, just doing simple arithmetic to identify tuples. Most, of the, most databases in the real world, uh, in terms of the number of percentage attributes that they have, not the size of the data, but the percentage of attributes, most of the time it's going to be integers or numeric values. Um, again, we, we did a survey that, that shows this is the case. But most of the data itself is actually going to be varchars and strings. And this makes sense, right? Like you have your zip code, that's a number, that's pretty small. But then like your name or email address, that's a, that's a string that's going to be much larger. So this is why we're going to have to you know, use a lot of compression or rely on compression to get this size of the database down and also convert everything to fixed length. That's super important. Another thing that we're even going to talk about, um, we'll talk a little bit about next class, is that you guys are sort of spoiled in this modern era of these column store systems because they're so fast now that you don't have to have a database administrator spend a lot of time, or spend any time really, uh, working on the actual schema itself and denormalizing tables to get it down to like a snowflake schema or a star schema. Because right? you just take your, you, you know, bunch of, you have a bunch of parquet files you just stick whatever system that can process them at it, and it's going to rip through the columns very quickly, and produce results. In the old days, like in the 90s, you'd have to have a DBA to sit down and like, okay, let me try to convert things to fact tables and, and to reduce the number of joins and get things down to be just these giant super wide tables so that the system was fast enough to, or could, could handle you know, complex queries on them. So people still do it. DBAs can do these things. Uh, but a lot of people don't have DBAs at their companies. They just have a bunch of files and they, they, they shove a OLAP engine at it. That's a pretty big, big change in how people, in the last 10 years, about how people organize data warehouses. Yes? So even if we're using this modern data system, like, you still have to do joins, right? So yes. Like, why doesn't denormalization provide any sort of advantage? Or it's 
just not as big an advantage as it was before. The col his question is, uh, you know, if if you have normalized tables, don't you aren't you aren't you aren't going to have to do joins? The answer is yes, but the the performance the performance of these systems has gotten so fast that like yes, joins are, are going to be the most expensive thing you're doing in the system most of the time, uh, but like they're so fast that like it doesn't it's not worth the effort. You'll you'll still get a, you know you'll still be an advantage to it of denormalizing it, but then there's other like soft costs or not soft costs. There's other engineering costs and and uh, the time to set it up, but now also you have this denormalized data that like someone's got to understand what the hell they actually are. Versus like if you have the raw data files in, in, in a column or storage, you still have to do joins in them. But like now it's more easy for new people to come along and say, "I know it's in this this table." Okay, so now we're out of time. Uh, so next class, so next Wednesday, we'll be here if for real. I'm back in town. Uh, we're going to spend time talking about how to accelerate OLAP queries beyond just doing sequential scans. So I've been saying multiple times sequential scans are super fast. Uh, and there are maybe ways to build auxiliary data structures to improve that performance. The spoiler is going to be that the, the paper you're going to read about sketches, we'll also talk about bitmap indexes. These can give you a big, hit, big win. As far as I know, nobody does it. Uh, no major system does it. The, the most indexes you'll get will be inverted indexes that do fast like text search. Um, and then zone maps will be the other thing that everyone does. That's going to be a huge win as well. And again, it's, it's an auxiliary data structure where it's a summation of the table, table's contents that you can use to, to do early pruning. That's, 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 that's the best you're really going to be able to do because the overhead of maintaining an index is probably just not worth it. OK? And we'll also spend time talking about project one and why you can't do it in Rust. Okay? According to Chidi. All right, guys. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the S D Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. You homies on the cup, so you am a fool because I drink proof. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>